Menko, Ori! Escapi Menko! Shrimp has become a staple in the American diet, and it has grown to a $10 billion yearly industry around the world. For the longest time, consumers never thought much about where their food came from. In fact, shrimp harvests from both seas and farms have come with big ecological costs. Now with rising interest in healthy food and a thriving environment, a shift is underway toward growing shrimp while preserving nature. Every change of this sort needs a pioneer. In the realm of shrimp aquaculture, Linda Thornton is that pioneer. My name is Linda Thornton and this is my farm. I have only good words to say about Linda Thornton and I think that um, you know, without her efforts um, in, in my work, I think we probably would not have gotten as far as we have in Belize. I attended the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana and I was uh, studying agriculture, primarily animal science. And our, I was concentrating mostly on, on production of swine. And our, my senior year, I was working with Dr. Homer Buck, who had, was trying, he was in the fisheries department. The professor asked me if I wanted to learn how to breed some freshwater shrimp, which we brought in from Hawaii. And I did that, but I killed them all because I didn't know what I was doing. So a friend of a friend said she knew about a man building a shrimp farm indoors in Chicago. And it sounded like a crazy idea, which it was, but um, I went and interviewed with the man and he hired me. I was the first employee he had. We started a company called King James Shrimp and it was in a suburb right south of Chicago in a 100,000 square foot building. It ran for about three years and then it, it didn't financially make it, but technically it was really a great success. And then when that closed, a small group of us started a small consulting company and we uh, we went to the Cayman Islands in Jamaica because they were interested in building kind of a smaller version of that, but unfortunately that never happened either. Right after that time, I um, had received back from the IRS a, a refund, and um, my boss had always talked about Belize, that he thought it would be a fascinating place to go visit. So I took my refund and I came to Belize and uh, kind of instantly fell in love. Belize is a country located on the Caribbean coast of Central America, nested between Mexico and Guatemala. Because of its hundreds of ancient Mayan sites, lush tropical rainforests, abundance of islands, and its proximity to the second largest barrier reef in the world, it's becoming a must-see tourist destination. Linda wanted to be more than just a tourist and discovered an opportunity in Belize. There was a uh, trade journal called Aquaculture Digest and they had a, a small uh, article about a shrimp farm being built in Belize. Um, a gentleman from Lansing, Michigan had built it so I drove up to Lansing from, from Chicago and, and met him and asked him if I could come and work for him and he told me I wouldn't last one day here and I'm still here, so that's how I got to Belize. It was on her 30th birthday that she met her husband, Bill, suitably at a shrimp farm. My husband at the time was the, uh, was what we call a shrimp husband, you know, I had the job and he didn't, he was very frustrated. So he wanted to do something on his own. And because of my agricultural background, I said, well, we need, we need pigs in this country, we don't have enough pigs. So my husband got the idea that uh, we're gonna start a pig farm. And in those days, you could lease uh, land for like $2 Belize an acre a year. So for, for 200 US dollars, we could, we could farm this land. Uh, we started this pig farm and it was, uh, <laughs> it, it was a lot of work. Then later on, I, I acquired another 200 acres. So now I have 400 acres here. But I was able to purchase that 400 acres for 16,000 US dollars. So that was part of the dream of coming to Belize, it was kind of like pioneer days, you know. Linda and Bill's farm plans continued, and they were about to deliver their next load of pigs to the meat plant, a transaction that would have provided enough money to pay off the loan taken to finance the farm. But on the night of October 12, 1994, everything changed. My husband and I were with some friends and we were coming home from Placencia late at night and um, our boat got hit by another one. And my husband 
and two other men got killed, and I, I had a spinal injury. But um, luckily, I was able to go to the States. I, I got medevaced to New Orleans, and then um, since my family's from Chicago, they, they took me to the Rehab Institute in Chicago, which was a, a wonderful place. After surgery and months of rehabilitation, she returned to Belize in 1996 and slowly tried to rebuild the pig operation. At the same time, despite constant pain and limited mobility, she went to work at not just one shrimp farm, but two. I really admire Linda Thornton. She's a person um, who has overcome a lot of adversity. And, and she's probably one of the toughest, most competent people I've met. I mean, this is a person that's barely able to walk some mornings and she gets up and, you know, goes to a shrimp farm and, and runs a thousand acres of shrimp farms and then comes home and then runs her own farm. And, um, and that's, that's not a trivial thing. At the time, shrimp farming was rapidly expanding in Belize and Linda became a central figure in the industry. The coastal area of Belize is almost the perfect environment for shrimp farming. Uh, the soils are clay soils. Uh, the land was, there was a lot of open land at those days. And, and of course our water. Uh, Belize had a, a, a great labor force that was very willing, very educated, and uh, didn't have jobs. So we, we were able to get a lot of good people to work with us at the beginning. And um, the entrepreneur spirit is very good here, and people came in and built shrimp farms. As soon as one was successful, another one would just start right away. From the 1990s onward, the shrimp industry was booming from Thailand to Texas, with shrimp fleets and farms hauling in fast-growing harvests. This once pricey seafood was fast becoming a mainstay of the middle-class diet. It's, uh, it's like eating hamburger now rather than uh, a real fancy uh, fish dish. While shrimp farming in Belize has had its ups and downs, today Linda is involved in three busy operations, Aquamar, Haney, and her own farm, Cardelli, named after her father. The farms, which together sprawl over 1,200 acres, have dozens of ponds, reflecting the full range of methods used to grow shrimp. Some are densely packed and fed a sophisticated brew of harmless bacteria. Others have fewer shrimp and take little care to maintain. But all of the shrimp raised in these ponds begin life in a hatchery at Aquamar. The first step comes in a breeding tank, where huge Pacific white shrimp mingle and mate. Female shrimp lay hundreds of thousands of fertilized eggs, which soon hatch into tiny larvae. Algae is grown indoors and is fed to the larvae along with immature brine shrimp. Within three weeks, they're large enough to be transferred to the ponds. Their health and size are closely tracked through the four to eight months before harvest. With growth comes new environmental concerns. The country has tried to preserve a lot of its natural areas. Um, the water is one of our, and the reef, of course, is one of our, our biggest assets. Environmental groups in Belize and around the world pressured the shrimp industry to limit its impacts. Early on, Linda recalled how activists would try to disrupt scientific conferences. And it was just, it was kind of like a childish prank. And uh, I, I didn't see the purpose in it. We always felt that nobody had ever taken the time to, to come and talk to us. We would get a lot of bad press and everybody said we were bad, but we'd never have these environmentalists visit the farm. That all changed when she met Tim Smith. Tim did a study on the Pl Placencia Lagoon and uh, where the nutrients were coming. And he, he was the first one to present real data to show that, you know, not just hearsay that, oh, all shrimp farms are bad and they're polluting everything. But Tim collected real data and showed, yes, the, the shrimp farms do have an impact on the lagoon. But he also showed that the tourism development had a large impact that other people had not been considering. And we kind of appreciated that because, okay, now we're all in this together, let's, let's work on it together. And, and Tim uh, would, would visit with us at the, the shrimp, we have a shrimp association, the growers, and he would spend time with us and they brought in WWF and uh, we started working together. The quality of the shrimp and the impact on the environment depend on three things, 
managing what the shrimp eat, the waste they produce, and the condition of the water they live in. Through experience, Linda found with Tim's help that some of the same practices that limit disease also limit pollution. We have learned how to manage our feed. That, that's really the most important thing. If you manage your feed and use less of it, you don't have as much nutrients in the effluent water. The difference is that we now have developed the bacterial system where we put water in the pond, we aerate, but we first get the good bacteria working, which breaks down all the waste created from feed in the pond. And um, that becomes um, actually feed for the shrimp also. But the best part of the system is you don't have to ever change the water. You use the same water. You, when we harvest a pond, we can actually store the water in another pond and, and just start all over again. You could reuse that water eight, 10, as many times as you can. So this is, uh, it's a very expensive system to set up. Not everyone has the money to do it, but it is our goals for the future that all aquaculture systems would be like this. Uh, there's marketing efforts now for people to understand uh, where, where does your food come from? Is it grown locally? How is it grown? Do they use antibiotics? Do they use chemicals? In Belize, we use no antibiotics or chemicals in our shrimp. And if you manage the shrimp properly and keep the environment healthy, they don't get sick. Every season ends with an all-night harvest, which Linda says is her favorite part of the cycle. Every time that shrimp is just pouring out, you're just, you're just so excited because you're getting all your answers to, to your work for the whole year. Linda and other farmers are now working with the World Wildlife Fund to develop a certification standard for sustainable shrimp. The WWF is, has a process called the Shrimp Aquaculture Dialogues and they meet with shrimp farmers. They also do it for tilapia and salmon and some of the other shellfish. Um, and they meet with shrimp farmers all over the world and together we were trying to develop a set of criteria that we can all adhere to. Within Shrimp Aquaculture, World Wildlife Fund has been looking for um, standards or developing standards for, um, for environmentally sustainable production. And that process has been going on for several years. They actually came to Belize and met with shrimp farmers there and shrimp farmers from around Central America and said, um, these are the kinds of things we'd like to accomplish. We're trying to build a model there within Belize that can be transferred to other countries and we'd like to see, you know, no use of antibiotics, no, no uh, removal of mangroves, for instance, which is a major impact of shrimp farming. Um, we'd like to see good labor practices. We'd like to see a lot of the things that exist right now within Belize um, transferred out into other countries as well. If, if they can establish a market and establish sort of a higher price for their um, products, I think, I think that they'll have sort of a sustainable future in, in production there. She just she's one of my favorite people. I, I think that uh, I think if we had more Linda Thorntons around the world, um, shrimp farming would would have a much better reputation than it does right now. Linda continues to work with other farmers and environmentalists to spread sustainable practices, but she already has her eye on a new frontier. There's a uh, systems called aquaponics, and it's the incorporation of aquaculture that culture of, of fish or some crustaceans with hydroponically grown vegetables. And uh, there's a lot of, lot of work being done all over, all over the world now by this. So my dream is in the next couple of years is to set up a, a very large production scale system of that here in Belize and train people to work it and then even go a step further and try to make some value added products out of the vegetables and the fish and that. And, uh, and provide the, the whole Caribbean with some maybe more um, like frozen foods and such that uh, uh, would be healthy, organically grown, and uh, make us all money. I think it was being the oldest of seven children uh, with a hardworking mother that, uh, you know, always pushed us to do things. Um, we, I, I don't know, I find my 50s are, uh, I think it's, is it menopause or what? But women go through this, this burst of uh, energy and they wanna, you're finally at that period, unfortunately I never had children, but um, you're, you're past your childbearing days and you've got all these experiences now and you don't have those responsibilities so much at home. 
And uh, I just have all these ideas that I've been wanting to do all these years. And uh, I finally have the financial means to do it. So it's fun. What am I going to do, sit, sit on the beach and drink pina coladas? That would that'd be kind of boring. <laughs> Is this cha-cha or something? It has a similar fondness.